go right down to business. So what's the plan of business for today? That's um, mo mostly it's going to be about material models. So that's this mysterious psi energy density function I was using the last time. I didn't, I didn't tell you like what, what it actually should be. But before we get there, I wanted to clarify a few things regarding the deformation gradient. That's kind of the main um, tool you use. That's also the input, by the way, to this to the psi function, right? The psi function takes as input the capital F. And just quickly remind me what the F was for everybody so we get on the same page. So we are looking at elastic object, right? That's, that's deformed somehow. We are quantifying the amount of uh, elastic energy stored in that object. And the basic tool is the deformation gradient. James? Yeah, you... The F was the linearization of the deformation. Exactly, the exactly. So linearization of the deformation function, AKA Jacobian. If we apply linear finite elements, meaning we that mesh everything, then this, this the deformation gradient um, I mean, it, it already is a three by three matrix, but it, uh, at the linear finite elements is a constant at three by three matrix for an entire element. So it's a very important thing there. And the one thing I wanted to clarify is that the deformation gradient is linear in X, okay? What is the relationship between the deformation gradient and your actual degrees of freedom, okay? So if you have, oh, I don't know why I put two, I want it to stay in 3D. If you have n particles or n nodes in your finite element mesh, each of them in three, three coordinates, then your actual degrees of freedom of positions are axes. Okay, then they are Vs for velocities, but now we are talking about the elastic energy potential, so it only depends on axis, right? The Vs only uh, affect the kinetic energy. So the deformation gradient is linear, which means that we should be able to represent it using a matrix, do some sort of form like F equals GX, okay? Where this G would be some, some kind of matrix, okay? Except that the, here is a little bit of a problem uh, because this mapping, even though it is linear, it's actually multilinear, right? Because the F, F is a three by three matrix, right? So this mapping G, it is a linear mapping, but it's a mapping from three n dimensions to uh, three by three matrices. Okay, so technically speaking, it's a tensor. A tensor, in this case, that would be basically like an extension. If, if matrix is like this 2D array of numbers, the tensor would be extending this to a three third dimension, having like a box of numbers. And it's possible to deal with it, but it gets a little bit annoying because you get more indices that have to always worry about like in, in what direction you are, you are doing your operations. So it, it's better to avoid tensor if you can. And here you can. Here is a, a nice trick which uh, lets you basically convert this G to a matrix. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the fact that this should be a tensor. This trick is actually very useful. It's called vectorization. If you are familiar with like MATLAB programming or something like this, then you are already probably doing this. In, in, in MATLAB, this would be called reshape. But this has very nice algebraic properties, which I would like to mention, which are useful for deriving um, some formulas related to elasticity or, or fit based in general. So first of all, what is, what is a vectorization operation? So if I have an arbitrary matrix, which is an M by N matrix, so the matrix looks like this. It, it has some columns. The columns I can call A1, a2 and so on up to a n okay so it's m rows and columns so then the vectorization of this matrix simply means take all of the columns and stack them one by one into one super tall long uh, column vector okay so this was an m by n matrix and this vectorized version of this this is going to be m n times one vector okay so really nothing very special going on. I just take all of these column vectors. Those, those are all vectors. If you want, I can give them little arrows. And really just like reorganize the way they are stored. Okay, that's, that's it. There is an inverse operation to it too. The inverse operation, so this is called like a vec, vectorization operation. It's an operation which takes an M by N matrix and turns this into M N by one matrix. The inverse operation I could denote as math. It's exactly the opposite idea. So it's mn by one to m by n. And uh, it's just the inverse of it, okay? So if you do mat vac of a, you just get back a. So basically the mat 
takes these pieces and reshuffles it back to a matrix. You, of course, need to know the dimensions we are working with, right? You need to know kind of the types of the matrices. Okay, so that's what we're gonna use to kind of get ready to, to convert this uh, three by three matrix into a nine by one vector. And if we do this, then instead of dealing with a tensor here, this becomes just a regular matrix. So I'm gonna show you how to actually derive this matrix using the algebra of vectorization. Now, an interesting thing, uh, the vectorization is very closely related to another uh, uh, algebraic or matrix algebra concept, and that's called the Kronecker product. How many of you heard about Kronecker product before? Yeah, it's not super well known. It's a very simple thing, but it's also quite useful. So let's say I still have a matrix uh, A, which is an M by N matrix. And let's say I also have a matrix B, which is a K by L matrix. Okay, so completely arbitrary dimensions. So the Kronecker product of A and B, this is how it's usually denoted using this X in a circle. So it is something pretty simple. I, what I do, I take every element of the A matrix and I multiply it by the B matrix, okay? So it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be AM1 times B and AMN times B, okay? So each of the scalars gets upgraded to a matrix. It's the B matrix multiplied by that scalar. So altogether, this thing is going to be what dimension matrix? Tell me. It's going to be a big matrix, right? Because every scalar, every element became a matrix. <laughs> Almost. Uh, MK by NL, that's right, MK by NL, right? So each of the Bs has K rows. I have M rows here, so that's the M times K. And similarly, each of the Bs has L columns, right? And I do this N times, so that's the N times L. And the cool thing is that this Kronecker product can be basically used to unfold tensors into matrices, okay? And that's uh, thanks to the fact that it has some interesting algebraic properties, which we are going to use. Or, you know what, let me write the properties on another page when we're actually going to use it. So, um, one of the properties is that if you have A Kronecker B, matrix multiplication with C Kronecker D, then this is actually equal to A times C, Kronecker B times D, okay? So this is how the Kronecker product plays with the regular matrix product, okay? That's what I have here. Now this assumes that the matrix dimensions agree, okay? What I mean by that is that you cannot always multiply the two matrices, right? The, the number of columns of the second matrix, of the first matrix must be the same as the number of rows of the second matrix. So if, if this is satisfied, then this, this holds, okay? Another cool property is that if you have A Kronecker B and then you transpose the whole thing, that it's equivalent to transposing T and doing the Kronecker with a transpose B, okay? But then the same is true also for inverse, if the inverses exist, okay? And probably the most important property is the one that ties together the vectorization and Kronecker product. There is a relationship between the two. And it's actually kind of cool. If you vectorize... Um, oh, let me, let me first use an... Uh, let me first say that I have a matrix X, which is an N by P matrix. And now I can say... So let me just remind you that A was an M by N matrix, okay? So if you are going to vectorize the product of A times X, which are the two arbitrary matrices, I guess I just wanted to clarify the dimensions here to make it clear that we really can multiply A by X, right? Because this N is the same as this N over here. So the vectorization of this product, that's something interesting. You can write it either as IP, Kronecker product with A, times vectorized X, 
or equivalently, you can also write it as X transpose Kronecker I M uh, vectorized A. Okay, so this I P and this I M that means uh, P by P identity matrix. Okay, this means of course M by M identity matrix. Okay, let's just check that the dimensions really agree. Okay, so the vectorization of A times, so it A times X is going to be an M by P matrix, right? So this is going to be MP times one vector. So if I take A and I do Kronecker with IP, what is going to be the dimension here? That's going to be PM by PN, right? So vectorized, so this is this is Pn, so that agrees with the dimension of x. That's that's Pn two, so that's that's good. I, I, this actually works. This this is no no nonsense. And similarly here, x transpose that's gonna be p times n, right? Maybe let me write it here, p times n. So if I Kronecker with I m, that means I will get m p by m n matrix, okay. But the vectorized n is an m n by one vector. So indeed, I can multiply the two, and indeed, I will get m p by one vector. Okay, so this, the, the types really hold. So this is a very useful identity, which basically lets you convert matrix multiplication to a matrix vector multiplication. Okay, that's kind of you can kind of see the tensors acting here because the x was a matrix here, right? But this thing is just a vector. Okay, so that's how we can kind of shave off one of the dimensions of, of your tensors. And that's exactly what we are going to do to um, get some nice formulas about the deformation gradient. Okay, is this, is this clear, the Kronecker product and vectorization? You can, if, uh, there's a good, there are good Wikipedia uh, websites on it, which I always refer to if I, if I forget the, these equalities. So if you, just, if you just Google it, this is what will come up. All right. So uh, we started with the deformation gradient, which is a three by three matrix. Well, let's look at the vectorized deformation gradient, okay, back F. So that, of course, is a nine by one vector, right? And that means that now this vectorized deformation gradient, we can write as a mat some matrix G multiplied with the vector X, okay? This is still our three N by one vector of all the coordinates of all the degrees of freedom, all the world space or deformed space vertices, okay? So now the G, of course, is going to be a 9 by 3N matrix, right? Because it needs to convert a 3N vector into a 9-dimensional vector. So by the way, here I kind of assume that I picked one element, okay? I picked one tetrahedron, and I kind of figure out what, what's going what's gonna to be the deformation gradient for that one tetrahedron. Now that's of course, uh, uh, in an actual implementation, you do this for all of the tetrahedrons, one by one, but the process is still the same, so we can just talk about one, just, just to be clear, okay? I could also give this like a uh, uh, subscript T, and then I would just have the T for like a tetrahedron, but I have to carry it everywhere, so let's just, let's just keep in mind this is for a single tetrahedron, okay? Information gradient. Maybe let me write it here. For a given something like this. Okay. Okay. So uh, the last time we derived that the f equals d s d m inverse, where this d m matrix depended just on the rest pose. So we can assume that is constant because we only uh, study how the deformation gradient changes when x changes. Okay. We can also assume that the rest pose is just fixed. So the DS matrix, those were the edges of the tetrahedron in the deformed pose. So that's the only thing that depends on X. Now if I, uh, so here is where I can apply these vectorization tricks, okay? So if I have my vectorized F, that means that I'm vectorizing DS, DM inverse, right? And here I can directly apply this, this, these identities, right? So let me apply this one because I want to isolate the DS. Okay, so applying this one to this case, what does that mean? That means that I will get dm inverse transpose Kronecker i3, because that was a 3 by 3 matrix, and the vectorize ds. Okay. So that's just applying this, this, this rule, the, the vectorization of matrix product. Okay. 
Now, what is the vectorized DS? So the DS matrix uh, had just the edges of the pet. So this is just the reshaping of the matrix. So this is going to be a vector which has x1 minus x4 first, then x2 minus x4, and then x3 minus x4, okay? Where the x1, x2, x3, and x4 are the actual world space coordinates of, of these three nodes of the tet. Okay? And this is, of course, a 9 by 1 vector. I find it helpful to always like re remind yourself what the dimensions are to kind of to keep doing sanity checks that the things actually at least pass a syntax test. Okay, so this is a clearly just a linear operation on the on the big x vector, right? On on this guy on the three n by one vector. So this three n by one that means that those are all the nodes in my mesh, but I need to extract only the nodes, only this x one, x two, x three, x four corresponding to the nodes of of my, of my one tetrahedron, okay? Of the tetrahedron I'm looking at right now. Uh, I can do this, right? It's not so hard because for, for each of the nodes, I have an index number, right? Like I know that this guy is, has index, I don't know, 17. This one has index like 63. I'm just making it up 51, 114, okay? Those are just the indices of the vertices in, in, in the X vector. Just, just very similar to a triangle mesh. It's, a, it's for that mesh. All right, so the vectorized DS, I can write like this. So I can uh, so uh, I can form a matrix, which is essentially a matrix that will convert the axes into uh, these uh, these edges. Okay. So what that means that's going to be a matrix that looks like this: one minus one, and maybe one here, and minus one over there. Zeros everywhere else. Okay. Kronecker I three, and this whole thing gets multiplied with x. Okay. So what the hell does this mean? So this is a matrix which I'll call S, and it is a three by n matrix. Okay. And what I, what do I have here? This so this this it has three uh, rows, and each of the rows I have only two non-zeros. Okay, the one and minus one. The one corresponds to the index of the first node. Okay, so in this case it would be seventeen. And the minus one corresponds to the index of the fourth node. In this case, this would be the 114. Okay, that's what I that's what I wrote here. The second row would be the same thing, except that now I'd have here I would have the index for x2, so it would be like 63 or something. This would be still the same one, the index of x4. Okay. And this is a Kronecker of it I3, just to kind of say that the same uh, operation is going to be applied on the x, y, z coordinates. Okay, that's that's why I have this three. That's for the x, y, z coordinates of each of the vertices. And this x, that's still my three n by one vector, which has all the axes in it. Okay. So this multiplication, so this matrix S Kronecker I3 applied to x, multiplied with the vector x, it does two things. First, it selects the nodes corresponding to my given that, and second, it subtracts them, okay? It subtracts all the x1, x2, and x3 from x4. And that clearly gives me what I wanted here, okay? So this is basically a matrix representation of, of this operation. Take the, the first uh, node coordinates, subtract from the fourth node coordinate. So this is a matrix way of saying the same thing. It's kind of like a way of like uh, programming, except that it's just in terms of matrix algebra kind of thing. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on this? So it's like a selection matrix. Yes, yes, that's why I call it S because it's a se selector matrix. It's a little bit more than selector. Selector would just have the ones, and that would just like pick some of them. Uh, this also has the subtraction in it, so it like immediately already subtracts the x1 from x4, right? Like you, you can see what, what's gonna happen, right? This I3 just upgrades all these guys to a three by three identities, right? And then I just hit this with this vector. So it indeed, it picks the, the corresponding uh, node here and here and subtracts them. 
just something you need to think about for a second. But then, then you are down with this like nice, neat formula. That, that's what I li like about it. S Kronecker I3X, and that's like a neat way of writing it down. Okay, so we have this, so we can put it together. So and here I wrote what vec ds is, that's this, and here I know what vec f is. So we, we can just put these things together, and we will see that, so I'll copy this first part, dm inverse transpose Kronecker i3, that's this part here, and then the vec ds, that's this, okay, so I can put there this, so I can put there s Kronecker i3 and x, okay? Well, now I have this property here, and here I can conveniently use it because the matrix dimensions do agree. So what I get is this is equal to dm inverse transpose times the selector Kronecker i3 applied to x, okay? And voila, this is my G matrix, okay? You can indeed verify that this is a 9 by 3 N matrix. Let's check that, so, right? So let me write it. S Kronecker I3. So the S uh, matrix was, what was that? That was a uh, 3 by N matrix, right? Uh, DM, that's a 3 by 3 matrix. So this whole thing is a 3 by N matrix. If I do Kronecker with I3, I upgrade it to a 9 by 3 N matrix. So indeed, I, I, get, I get the right dimensions. Okay, and by, by this reasoning, the G matrix, that's, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. That's a matrix way to encode the vectorized deformation gradient for uh, as, as a matrix vector multiplication with my state vector X, okay? So here I have kind of the linearity of the deformation gradient with respect to the current state X exposed in terms of a matrix. So it's also like a neat way to kind of think about the coding because that kind of organizes your computation. So you, you, you figure out the indexing stuff once, that the indexing stuff, that's what's hidden in S, okay? And then you're done with it. By the way, if for a different tetrahedron, you would of course have a different S and different DM, okay? The X would still be the same. The X is the state of the entire system. James? Is there, is there an advantage to storing it in a giant matrix as opposed to making it a giant like H? That's a great question. I actually meant to comment on it too. I am not saying you should store this as a matrix, okay? okay. <laughs> this, this is the way the algebra works. Whether you like it or not, the, the linear operator can be represented by this matrix. Now, in terms of numerical linear algebra, like we talked about before, right? That's an entirely different story, right? How do you implement it? Whether you use some sparse matrix class or not, that's an entirely different story. And actually, you have to be very careful because if you explicitly build this G matrix, even if it's a sparse matrix, it might be inefficient. Okay, because think about it. How how sparse is this G matrix? It's actually a good good test question if you if you kind of got it. <laughs> how many non-zeros roughly do we have in this G matrix? The number of tetrahedrons in the matrix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh uh, the less than that. Even like asymptotically. <laughs> But then if, if you look at how it was, I mean, look at how it is built, right? This is just a 3 by 3 matrix. Fine, this is a 3 by n matrix, but how, how many non-zeros do I have there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 non-zeros, okay? It's only a handful of non-zeros here, right? This is just, this also just has 3, so this multiplies the number of non-zeros by 3, right? You can actually figure out the exact number. On my point, that's going to be a constant number, something small, like 50, I would say, Okay? So even though this would this is a 9 by 3n matrix, the number of non-zeros does not depend on n. The number of non-zeros is constant, okay? So you can represent it as a sparse matrix, but you, you have to be careful what exact type of sparse matrix storage your code is using, because you definitely don't want to be allocating anything of asymptotical size n, because then you would be wasting space, okay? Because this only has very, very few non-zeros, okay? 
So my point is this, is this is not a recipe that you should be necessarily implementing it like this. Feel free to implement it whatever way. You'll have a class for tetrahedron with indices or, or something like this. But this is uh, uh, at least a convenient way to check whether your code is doing the right thing. Because at the end of the day, it should still be doing this matrix vector product, regardless of how is it hardwired in, in the code. Okay. So this is kind of like the abstraction on the level of linear algebra. And there is yet, yet another, another level, uh, lower level, how do you actually implement that linear algebra, right? And as I said, that's not uh, always that trivial if you want to be efficient. So even here you need to think about it. Did it make sense? Like that only has very few non-zeros, okay? This almost everywhere is zero, right? This, this G, it's a, it's a weird kind of matrix, right? This has 9, and this has 3n. Well, n can be 10,000 easily, right? So it can be 9 by 30,000. Almost everywhere is zeros, okay? Almost everywhere. More than 99.9% .9 is zeros, okay? Okay, so if you are done with this, um, I mainly wanted to introduce you to this concept of the Kronecker product and vectorization, which is a convenient tool to avoid the confusion of tensors. <laughs> All right, so the main topic for today is the psi function, okay? So that's the function, the energy density function, which maps deformation gradient to an amount of deformation or energy, deformation energy. It's kind of fun thing to think about what should uh, good deformation energies B. Or I can, by the way, do it as like a psi tilde, which will take the vectorized form of the deformation gradient. It's the same thing, it just sliced and diced in a slightly different way. Okay? So if you open like a continuum mechanics book, you will find an entire zoo of materials. There is Muni Rivlin, Ogden, and now Hookian, uh, all these kind of materials in biomechanics that would be fung elastic material. So lots of clever people in the past developed lots of models for exactly this. Okay, that's what we are talking about. What I would like to do today is to kind of give you a way to understand why there is so many models and what are the relationships between them. Okay, not just give you like a laundry list of formulas. Hey, this is what you should use because that's what smart people proposed in the 19th century. But just to give you more, not to give you like a critical way to think about it. So here is how I like to do it. So the idea is that this takes a deformation gradient and measures the potential. Okay, the potential means the amount of deformation. Always you can think about this is just a generalization of a spring. Okay, in a spring it was kind of easy because you only had like kind of two principal modes of deformation. You could either stretch it or compress it, right? And those two are actually not terribly different, right? And the more you stretch it, the higher this, this output you will get, the higher the potential you will get, right? This is a generalization of that idea for tetrahedron. That's one way you can think about it, okay? Or because this could be infin infinitesimally small, a small box of material you are subjecting to a linear deformation. Some kind of small blob of material which you are subjecting to some linear transformation, you are measuring how much potential energy is going to be stored in it, okay? All right, so let's start. Um, so why to make things any more complicated than just taking the deformation gradient and computing the Frobenius norm of it? Okay, this is my first proposal. How about using this? The Frobenius norm, just uh, in case you, it doesn't immediately click, that's something very simple. That's just a sum of the elements of the matrix squared. Okay, in my case, all these go from one to three, because that's a three by three matrix. Okay, that's the simplest way I can convert matrix to a scalar, to a non-negative scalar. The potential energy should not be, the elastic potential energy should not be negative. You saw that the gravity potential that can be negative, but the elastic potential energy, they should not be negative. Because in, uh, oh, and that's actually the punchline, so I don't want give to give, give away the punchline. Why this is not a good elastic potential energy? This is kind of the first thing you would come up with if somebody asks you to, Take a matrix and convert it to a non-negative number. 
Well, let's just take all the elements of the matrix, square them, and sum them together. You certainly get a number, right? That's unfortunately not a good elastic potential energy number. Why? It's kind of a good test if you if you got the idea. Uh, because if, um, so I have some, some object in some rest pose, right? And may maybe it's something, something like reasonable, some kind of bunny or some, something you want to be simulating. And that has some rest pose, okay. Yep. Is it because like, that's some sort of creature, like if the tip of this rest is deformed a lot, that would mean a lot less energy than if it's in the middle of the rest. Is that, is that what you're trying to get at? No, here is even uh, even more basic problem with this. <laughs> even more element, even more elementary problem with this energy. Uh, because uh, what the deformation so if this object is completely undeformed if it is in the rest pose okay if the if this x here if this x corresponds exactly to the rest pose so each of each there are some vertices here right there are there, there are some elements finite elements they have some, and, and the vertices the nodes they have some coordinates right so let me ask you this way what the deformation gradients are when this is undeformed not zero they are identities exactly so in the rest pose these F's are identities okay well that's a problem here right because if you put identity what is the Frobenius norm of identity three right one squared plus one squared plus one squared it's a three by three matrix so that is three well that means that the undeformed configuration is storing some potential energy right so if you run physics what physics does it tries to minimize the potential so what what would actually happen if i use this as elastic potential energy yeah it would shrink it would shrink to a point so if, if you run run this 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 entire animal would shrink to an entire point okay because at that point the deformation gradients then they would be zeros okay because if i if i subtract if i do the subtraction if all of them are at the same point, I get zeros here, right? But the Frobenius norm of a zero matrix is zero. It doesn't get lower than that. So that's where the energy would get minimized, okay? So this is not a, so this is not a useful measure of elastic potential energy. Nevertheless, uh, this actually is uh, an energy that is being used. It even has a name. It's, a, it's called Dirichlet energy sometimes, um, especially in geometry processing. And uh, even though it's not useful as an elastic deformation energy, it can be useful uh, in some other applications. Can you see how this could still be useful, this kind of energy? So this energy wants to shrink everything, right? This energy will be most happy, it will be minimized, it will be zero, when everything shrank to a point. So it kind of looks, it kind of acts as a membrane, right? That's always extended un un unless everything has collapsed to a single point. Can you see how it could possibly be useful? I kind of like bashed it, right? Like for elastic energy, that's not useful because it's gonna collapse your ob object. But it actually is used a lot. <laughs> some points are fixed, it's not useful. That's exactly right, yes. If, you, if some points are fixed, so in finite elements, there is a fancy term for it, it's called boundary conditions. If I, if I say, hey, Let's take this bunny and let's let's fix it here and let's fix this thing here and let's let's fix some other parts too then what this would do it would do basically like a membrane interpolation like the rest the rest would shrink somehow but the, the vertices that are fixed they couldn't move okay so that's 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 why this this energy is actually useful because if you give it some boundary conditions <laughs> the funny thing is that these these type of boundary conditions which you just fix those are also called Dirichlet boundary conditions okay you might have heard that there are also Neumann boundary conditions or boundary conditions on the derivatives that's a little bit different uh, but the Dirichlet boundary condition they just say freeze this in in place and the, then the rest can be shrinking but it cannot be shrinking to a point because you have the boundary conditions so that's, this is useful in some geometry processing applications. 
Nevertheless, for us, it doesn't work because it's not a good elastic potential energy. So that we are, what we are trying to get to is what size would work as an elastic potential energy. So what would it be in the next try? So this, this we discarded. The problem is that it doesn't zero out at the rest pose. So how can we fix that? Uh huh. Exactly. That's exactly right. So you subtract the identity because that's that's what the deformation gradient is in the rest pose, right? In the rest pose, the deformation gradient of every tat is the identity because it's undeformed, right? Identity just gives you the same tat. So if it's undeformed rest pose, then that's identity. Well, if I subtract the identity here, that means that in the rest pose, this will give me zero. So that's good, okay? Because now if you have a bunny or whatever and you hit simulate, then it doesn't move if it's in the rest pose. If the initial conditions is the rest pose with zero initial velocities, then the simulation will stay there, okay? It's immovable elastic bunny. It doesn't do too much, but it's much better than if it does something wrong, okay? So that's good. So this, this psi of identity, that of course is zero. So that, that is very good. But unfortunately, there is still a problem. What is the problem with this energy? That's slightly harder to see. Let's see if anybody. That's right, yes. Um, not rotation invariant. So what do I mean by this? So if I have a bunny and I, uh, oh, let's see if I can actually rotate a bunny in this, in this app. So I might not be able to. Hmm. What I wanted to do was to rotate that thing. So like imagine you have like a rotated version of a, of a bunny, okay? And if it's just rotated, the elastic energy should not change because the elastic energy only measures the deformations, right? So whenever I rotate it, uh, it should be the same. So mathematically, the rotation uh, means a change of coordinates in the world space or applying a rotation matrix after the deformation gradient, okay? So this R is an SO3 that matrix. That means uh, rotation in three dimensions, okay? And what this means is that I have the deformation gradient, that's a matrix, and I apply the rotation after that, okay? So you can think about, I have, I have some that over here, I apply a rotation to it, so I get a rotation version of that that, rotated version of that that. Well, um, elastic energy should be rotation invariant, meaning that the value of the, uh, of the uh, elastic energy potential should not change regardless of whatever, whatever rotation I apply to it. Unfortunately, that's not the case here, right? Because if I plug a rotation over here, this will actually increase, okay? Because the easiest to see, if, if in the identity, if uh, easiest is to see if I do, if I just do rotation minus I, if I, if I just rotate the rest pose, okay? Well, this thing is not going to be zero, unfortunately. It's going to be uh, stronger, greater than zero. So that means that the rotations incorrectly manifest themselves as increases in the elastic potential. So we do not want that. We would like this property to hold, okay? The question is how to make that happen. So we need to move so we can discard this model too. Even though, um, maybe I should not be that. Um, so that there is this problem. Uh, this is not always a deal breaker, okay? People in continuum mechanics use this a lot. This, this is basically a simpler version of linear elasticity. And if you are doing something like analyzing deformations of a bridge when like a tang goes over it, then the deformations are very small, okay? So meaning these rotations are very small, meaning you don't have to worry too much about this. And this is an okay approximation. 
okay? In graphics, you often need to rotate things a lot, right? Like if I have an arm that can go all, all, all this way around, so actually usually you do worry about lot rotations, right? Or if you have some things flying around with an, after an explosion, things rotate a lot, so you do want to worry about rotation invariance. But in some application, this is actually not a bad approximation. But if you want rotation invariance, how can we get it? What is the simplest rotation invariant model? So that means we need to design a new psi such that if I give it, so the, such that this equality is satisfied. So I somehow need to make this formula discard this R. Oops. How can we do that? So the simplest uh, rotation invariant psi it looks like this. So you take f transpose f and you subtract the identity. Okay, you're subtracting identity because we still want this property to hold, right? And the f f transpose f it's there to exactly discard the rotation, right? Because see see what's gonna happen if I if I take this sign and I feed into it r f. You kind of see what's what's going to happen. I'm going to transpose uh, RF, right? So I get FTRT and now times RF minus identity property is norm squared, okay? Okay, but this R, that's a rotation, okay? So I, R transpose R is identity, okay? So this is just FTF minus identity property is norm squared and that is just psi of F, okay? So that really is rotation invariant, this energy. And this uh, is a special type of uh, material model that's called Sand Venan Kirchhoff. The full Sand Venan Kirchhoff is like another term there, but this, this is kind of the core idea. And this is also where you can start seeing, as I was saying before, that some people prefer to factor this psi into two functions, into a strain uh, and a material model, okay? So here the key idea is to discard the rotation by doing this FTF. So you can say, you can define like a strain, like psi green, because this is called the green strain tensor. And that's essentially this FTF minus I, okay? And then you could say you have C psi material, which would be just, let's say, of X. That would be just the Frobenius norm square of X, okay? And then you can say that this, this, this psi would be then equal the psi material composed with psi green, or I can write it also as psi material applied to psi green applied to my deformation gradient, okay? So the idea, uh, this is the idea of the strain tensor, that it kind of does this geometric work of discarding the rotation for you, and then you can plug whatever material model to actually uh, extract the potential. This still gives you a matrix, right? This this psi green here, this psi green to give you the type of the function that's also from a matrix to a matrix, okay? So that just does some processing to the deformation gradient to make, to be a rotation invariant, right? The strain tensor already here is rotation invariant. And then you plug in the actual conversion to the uh, elastic energy potential after that. So that kind of makes sense, right? Because then maybe, maybe you say, oh, maybe the quadratic is not good enough. Maybe I need like higher order polynomial to represent my properties of my rubber or something like this. So you can make this more complicated, but you can just keep the same strain tensor, okay? So that's the, that's the kind of the reason why some people like to think uh, about it in terms of strain tensors. It's not necessary because you can always just think about it in terms of the psi function um, altogether. That's kind of what I prefer. Okay, so uh, the Sandvenan Kirchhoff that's sometimes abbreviated just as STVK because the Sandvenan Kirchhoff is a mouthful. And you can, you can read this when you are like reading some like finite element libraries or continuum mechanic texts. And that's, that's what it means. 
Now, of course, the pro so you you have you gain rotation invariance, but you also complicate uh, things a little bit, right? So far, these previous models they were quadratic in F, okay? Because F is linear in X, they mean that they are also quadratic in X, okay? X X are your degrees of freedom, the the different positions, okay? What about this? Now this got a little bit more nonlinear, right? What what is it? It's no longer quadratic, right? Quartic, exactly. So this is a quartic polynomial. Both in X and in F, okay? Because they are just linearly, linearly related. So yeah, so the nonlinearity increased and that's the price you have to pay to gain rotation invariance, okay? There is no linear way to get proper rotation invariance. Rotations are inherently nonlinear. But this is this is okay, the fact that it's quartic polynomial. There are actually more com even more complicated models which are in use. So the quartic polynomial actually is still on the easier side of things. And at the end, we'll be anyway using Newton to solve this or some modification of Newton, which can totally handle these nonlinear energies. Okay? Just I just wanted you to be aware that you are you're increasing the complexities. All right, so there is um, one, uh, there is still a problem with STVK. STVK is still not the final answer, okay? Let me show you what the problem is. Let me give you an example. What if the deformation gradient happens to look like this? Minus one, okay? So it's almost like identity. If it was identity, it would be the tet undeformed, right? But here I just flipped the last coordinate to make it minus one. First of all, what kind of deformation does this correspond to? If I have a tetrahedron like this, right, with some nodes, if I subject it to this deformation, let's say that the last axis Z points up to be, to be concrete, and this, this base of the tetrahedron is in the XY axis, so the XY axis, those are the ones here. What happens to the tetrahedron if I deform it by F? Yes, exactly. It, that's exactly right. Uh, this uh, this is called inversion, that term you were looking for. And you're right, it's exactly this, this symmetric flip. It's kind of like turning a glove inside out or when an umbrella in a wind like flips the, the, other, the other way around. That, 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 that's kind of the thing, okay? And it's a kind of drastic deformation of the tetrahedron. Like the shape looks, looks kind of the same. But the way it had to get there, like that means that this, this vertex, if you were like applying it progressively, right, then this means that this vertex is going down. At some point, this tetrahedron is flattened to a triangle, actually, and then it, then it, then it keeps inverting, right? Then it keeps going, and then finally the vertex gets over there. So it's a pretty drastic deformation of the tetrahedron, okay? Now the problem with STVK is that if you feed it this, this F, then what is going to be FTF? Well, FTF is going to be identity, right? So that means that the psi STVK is going to be how much on this particular F? It's going to be zero. And that's not good, okay? Because even though it has been deformed very dramatically, the STVK material kind of is oblivious to that. So basically what happened, we were asking for rotation invariance, and we got that, but we got more than that. Okay, we got more than we were asking for. Because what we also get, we also got invariance to reflections. Okay, this is a reflection, by the way. If there was a mirror in the XY plane, if there was a, this is the XY plane. If there was a mirror, this is exactly the transformation the mirror would produce. So that's why it's called a reflection. So we gained, unfortunately, also invariance to reflections. Okay, and we don't want that. So if we want to be invariant only to rotations, what we uh, can do is sign SVD, single value decomposition, okay? What that means is that you take your deformation gradient and you split it, you factorize it into three matrices, U, sigma, VT, where both U and V are rotations, SO3, and the sigma is a diagonal three by three matrix, they are all three by three, three by three, three by three, Everything is three by three here. 
And this is a diagonal matrix, which has sigma 1, sigma 2, the singular values on the diagonal. And the singular values are ordered. I mean, that's the, that's the funny thing, that actually the order is kind of arbitrary. That's one of the problems of SVD. The usual convention to, to kind of break this um, ambiguity is to assume that they are ordered like this, okay? And the signed SVD means that these U and Vs are pure rotations and the sigma 3 is actually can be negative, okay? This is okay. This is allowed. Uh, the more common SVD conventions are that these would not be rotations, okay, and this would not be allowed to be negative. They would all have to be uh, non-negative, okay? But what we need here is this signed SVD variant because we, we need these U and Vs to be proper rotations, okay, as O3. Then these sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, they are sometimes called the principal stretches, Okay, and once you have done this um, signed SVD, then you can define a material model which looks like this, which takes the sigma thing and subtracts it from identity and does Frobenius norm squared out of this, okay? Meaning, you still it's still a function of f, but you run the SVD, you decompose it in these matrices, you discard u and v, you keep only the sigma, you subtract identity, uh, and you can, by the way, see immediately that this is, uh, of course, nothing but uh, this, right? The sigma i minus 1 squared, right? Because those are just diagonal matrices. So the Frobenius norm of diagonal matrices is just squaring the diagonal elements and summing them together. Everybody sees that? By the way, there is another way how we can write this. Because this uh, sigma came from here, and for Frobenius norm, it is true that for any rotation matrix, the Frobenius norm squared is just this, okay? Even, even if the R multiplies it from the right. So I can also write this as U sigma V transposed minus U V transposed, okay? That's from the properties of the Frobenius norm, okay? Well, but this u sigma v transpose, that was my original deformation gradient, right? That's my f. That's that's still the input. You know, well, let me make it let me make it explicit here. Psi is still a function of f, okay? That that did not change. And this thing u v transpose, we can call this R because that's gonna be a rotation matrix, okay? And we can rewrite it like this, okay? Now this R is a very special rotation matrix that's called, that's the best fit rotation. What do I mean by that? What do, what do I mean is that this R is the argument of F minus X, probably is number squared, over all uh, rotation matrices. Okay, so let me pause for a second and explain this. If I give you a matrix and I ask you to find the closest rotation to the matrix. As some of you know this as a Procrustes uh, analysis, okay? Then, uh, then you get this R matrix, which is exactly the product of the U, V transpose factors of sine SVD, okay? Uh, this is also related to uh, polar decomposition. I guess maybe I should say, say also sine polar decomposition to be uh, 100% um, uh, correct, because if you remember, polar decomposition factorizes an arbitrary matrix into a rotation and a symmetric positive semi-definite factor, okay? The polar, polar decomposition can be obtained from SVD, so if you already have this SVD, you can do this trick, okay? I'll just write the SVD, use sigma VT, and the trick here is to plug in here, you can, you can, oh, let, me, let me draw it like this. You can put an identity matrix here, right? You can put an identity matrix anywhere, it doesn't change anything. But the identity matrix can be written as V transpose V, right? Because the V is a rotation, so that's a one funny way of writing the identity. But it's kind of cool because if you write it here, so you get V transpose V sigma VT, then you can use matrix multiplication associativity and do it like this, okay? And say that, hey, this is gonna be my R matrix and this is gonna be my S matrix. 
So you factorize the F into a rotation, okay? This is SO3. And this S is symmetric, positive, semi-definite. Obvious, obviously it's symmetric, right? Because the sigma is diagonal. So if I transpose it, I get the same thing, right? And I am lying to you because it's not positive semi-definite. It's just symmetric, right? Because I said that the, the last uh, in the signed SVD, uh, the last one could be negative, so that this one is not going to be positive semi. It would be in the other convention, so that's why I got confused. But so okay, it's just a symmetric matrix, okay? So the so this sign polar decomposition, let me put it like here. So, oops. Signed. So it factorizes an arbitrary matrix into a rotation and a symmetric part. That's a statement that's actually correct. Uh, this energy is sometimes called uh, corrotated rotated elasticity and that's the one that's that's usually used in physics based animation if you go to like see some Disney papers or something like that's what they end up using because it does not have that problem we had with STVK okay this one one minus one uh, because if you now feed to if I take this corot energy okay and I feed it uh, this matrix um, how much do I get? I don't get zero anymore, right? I get how much? So it's gonna, uh, minus one minus one is minus two, minus two squared is four, okay? So this thing does not zero out on the inverted thing. It will actually, this will actually have some potential associated with it. So, and that's, that's definitely better. So that's why this energy is preferred to corrotate it to STVK in general, even though there is, again, a price to pay for it. All these upgrades, they don't come for free. Here we have to actually compute the SVD, okay? And even worse, later we will be talking about that you also need the different, to differentiate these, these things. So you also need to differentiate the SVD, which is possible, but it's slightly annoying. Okay. So this is so far, um, all these uh, models I explained just like in the simplest possible case, just like a rough approximation of an elastic behavior, okay? We can, of course, like an easy modification is adding stiffness to it, right? Just like Hooke's law, you can multiply it by some, by some, by some coefficient and then say this varies over, over all tetrahedra, but we are still the work. All right, so I was writing an example in 2D with two deformation gradients, F1 and F2, okay? So th what this F1 does, so if I have some like small blob of material, or maybe let me draw it like this. What this does is an extension in the x-axis, so this would be the x-axis, this would be the y-axis, and compression in the y-axis, okay? So this would be deformation that looks something like this, okay? So if I have the same blob of material, same coordinate system, this is like I know how the how the reference uh, undeformed configuration looks like. Here I expand both coordinates by 1.5, so I extend this whole thing. Okay, so I expand the entire material on both directions. Okay, here I stretched in one direction and shrank in the other direction. Okay. Now the problem is that the 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 current material I, I defined. Uh, like this. So it's basically just the sum of these principal stretches minus one. Well, if you look at it, the psi of corot of F1, how much is that? That is 1.5 minus one, right? So it's 0.5 squared. And this is 0.5 minus one. So this is minus, um, minus 0.5 squared. Well, that doesn't matter, right? It's just 0.5 squared two. And the uh, corot on F2 uh, how much is that? So that's again 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. Oh, they are actually the same. Okay. So all these material models, including the most advanced one, the Cora, they actually don't differentiate between uh, something that increases the volume of the material by a lot and something that uh, better preserves the volume. 
Okay, it doesn't exactly preserve the volume, but this, this is kind of much more realistic deformation of the mud curl than this. If you, especially if you have something that's like highly incompressible, like something that has a lot of water content. So if you want to do a more accurate modeling of um, materials that resist changes of volume, we need to add some other term. Okay. So to get to, and this is called volume preservation, or at least approximate volume preservation, or I would say, I should say, maybe resistance to changes of volume. Okay, if you want to uh, model a material that would resist this deformation more than this, then we need to add some other term to the uh, potential energy. Okay. Well, uh, the basic tool for, how do I measure volume, by the way, of the deformed tetrahedron? I just compute the determinant of the deformation gradient, and that gives me the ratio of the volume of the deformed tat compared to the volume of the undeformed tat. Okay? Uh, that's again because the volume of the tat is just one sixth of the determinant of all the edges. Okay? So the determinant of F, I can also write if I have the SVD as U sigma V transpose which, uh, of course, the determinant does not change with rotation, so that's the same as determinant of sigma, okay, which is nothing but sigma 1 times sigma 2 times sigma 3, okay? And ideally, I would like, if, if the material is, if the tetrahedron is not compressed at all, not, does not change its volume, then the determinant is 1, okay? So I can design the following volume preserving term, psi, psi volume of F, which is simply the determinant of F minus one squared. Okay, I can also write it as sigma one, sigma two, sigma three minus one squared. Okay. Now that you can do, but this is a degree six polynomial in the principal stretches in sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, okay? So it's pretty highly nonlinear. And this is uh, usually approximated just by a second order polynomial. So it's usually approximated by doing the second order Taylor expansion at the rest pose, okay? Rest pose the corresponds to sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3 equals 1. Okay, uh, so if you actually compute this, I will not waste time with this, but I encourage you to actually work out what the second order Taylor expansion at the rest pose at this configuration looks like. And what you will get is sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 minus 3, the whole thing squared. Okay, so that's a quadratic approximation of this sixth order uh, term. Okay. In terms of matrices, you can also write this as the trace of sigma minus i, the whole thing squared, okay? The trace of a matrix is just sum of the diagonal elements, so this would be just summing the sigma 1, sigma one minus 1 plus sigma 2 minus 1 plus sigma 3 minus 1, then you square the whole thing. Sometimes you can just see this written as trace squared of sigma minus i, okay? And this, this term, this is what is usually added to your material models, okay? So usually, uh, so general corrotated, which is, uh, which is what is usually used in physics-based animation. So general corrotated model would look like this. It would be psi of f, then you would have some mu parameter, uh, sigma minus identity, Frobenius norm squared, plus lambda half, trace squared of sigma minus identity, okay? Where this mu and lambda, those are lambda coefficients. And they are, they are the material parameters, okay? This mu kind of uh, tells you the overall resistance of the deformation, and this lambda tells you how much does it resist at least the approximate volume uh, changes. There are, by the way, many other parametrization of these material properties. You might have heard about Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Those are other um, 
very common par parameterization. And there are formulas you can look up how to convert between Young's models and Poisson's ratio and, and the lambda coefficients. And there are many other, you can hear about bulk models and shear moduli and, and so on. Ultimately, it's just a parameter tweaking. So in FIS based, you basically just usually expose these to the user and then the user tweaks it somehow. In continuum mechanics or in mechanical engineering, you uh, look up these parameters somewhere in some dusted books because people measured it for uh, real world materials. And it has and it has physical units and so on. But I don't wanna get uh, too much into it because I only have this much time. Uh, one more uh, thing I wanted to explain is we can keep going with this, right? We just added another term here, right? We could, by the way, also add this term. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people do that too. It's slightly more nonlinear, but the Newton can usually handle that fine. Okay. Uh, so an interesting question is how many more parameters we can keep adding to, to better fit uh, how actual materials behave in the real world, okay? And here is an interesting, uh, uh, interesting way to think about it. So I told you that uh, every psi should be invariant to uh, rotations, right? This means... Uh, and, and this means uh, world space rotations. Okay, because what that means, I take my deformation, de so I have my rest post tetrahedron. The rest post tetrahedron gets deformed by F, and then I rotate it by R. Okay, so after the deformation, I rotate this. Okay, so every reasonable psi should have this, unless you can guarantee that you are doing some simulation which doesn't have large rotations in it. Okay. Now there is actually a different way of writing it. You could also do this, right? What if I do it the other way around? What if I require this? What does that correspond to? That means that I first rotate and then deform. Okay, so in this case, I am um, rotating in the material space. Okay, so is this true for all materials? The answer is no. This is true only for isotropic materials. So those are materials where the energy density function does not depend on the change of coordinates in the material space. In other, in other, in other sense, if I'm, in, if I'm like a small ant somewhere inside the material, I cannot tell the difference based on how the material was rotated. Okay. So if it's something homogeneous that doesn't have any internal structure, then you cannot tell the direction, you cannot find any distinguishing direction in the material. All directions behave as equal, okay? That's, that's isotropic. If it's something like steel reinforced concrete or biological tissues like muscle that have these muscle fibers in them, that's an example of anisotropic materials, okay? Because these like the steel reinforcement that will increase the stiffness, but only in a certain direction, okay? So those would be anisotropic materials. Well, let's talk about isotropic materials. So for isotropic materials, this is uh, true, okay? Of course, the first one has to be true too. This is true for both isotropic and anisotropic materials. This is true no matter what, okay? So for isotropic materials, both of them are true. So for isotropic, we can write that psi of R1 F R2 is the same of psi of F. Okay, because both of has to be invariant to rotations both in the material space and in the world space. Okay, well that means that if I apply it to uh, the deformation gradient, right? So if my psi of uh, the deformation gradient can be factored using SVD into U sigma V transpose. Well, if this is true, then it means that the U and V transpose they go away. So that the uh, energy density function can only depend on the sigma, okay? Where the sigma is just three numbers. The sigma is just sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, the principal stretches, okay? So this tells you that the maximum reasonable number of parameters of this psi is, is three, okay? Because the deformation gradient has nine numbers, but only three of them are relevant for isotropic materials, okay? 
By the way, this is not the only possibility to pick the principal stretches. There are other possibilities how you can how you can extract um, quantities from the deformation gradient which are invariant to both left and right rotations, to both world space and material space rotations. Okay, you can sometimes hear about isotropic invariants, and common ones are the following ones. It's called I1 which would be the trace of F transpose F, which is just a funny funny way of writing the, Frobenius, the squared Frobenius norm of F. Then you would have the second isotropic invariant, which is kind of similar. It would be the trace of F T F this thing squared. Okay, And then the third one would be our old friend, the determinant of F. Okay, you can check that all three are invariant to both left and right rotations. Okay, so they really are. Uh, they really are invariant. Uh, so this would be another way to parametrize all isotropic materials. Okay, so then the general material would be essentially some co a combination of these three values. Okay. Uh, the one um, kind of fancy material model is Neohookian elasticity or Neohookian material, which uses exactly these invariants. And it looks like this the psi of F is defined as mu half of I1 minus 3 minus mu logarithm of J, so the logarithm of the determinant of F plus lambda half of the squared logarithm of j, okay? But it's i1, that's just the squared Frobenius norm of f. The i2 actually does not appear there. And the mu and lambda, those are the lambda coefficients as before, okay? So the lambda, again, is a measure of incompressibility, and the mu is kind of like the overall deformation kind of thing. And you can, again, fit them against the real-world materials. Now, why, why this material model? So actually, one advantage is that you don't have to worry about the SVD, which is kind of nice. It's not a terrible difference. The SVD is not that bad to do. But here, here you have, like, directly, you can take the deformation gradient and directly compute that. Uh, this is actually very, this behaves very differently from the corrotated material. Can you see what the difference is to the corrot? And it's kind of the main uh, reason for these fancier material models. It also has to do, do with the inversion. Or it's related to the inversion. So as I was telling you about this experiment that we take a tetrahedron and we, we fix these in the plane, that the base we fix, and we take this uh, top vertex and we pull it down. Okay, at some point the tetrahedron gets volume zero. Okay, this is something that most materials cannot possibly do, right? Compress anything to zero volume is not realistic. Even like for things like air, right? You still cannot compress it to zero volume. Of air it would be like highly compressible. The, the, the funny uh, property of this uh, material model is that as j goes to zero, so the j, that's the measure of the volume ratio of the deformed tetrahedron, okay? So if you, as you are doing this thing, as you are pushing this closer and closer to flat, then the j is going closer and closer to zero, okay? The determinant is going to be eventually, because they will have zero volume eventually, right? Well, the nice thing is that as you as you do this, as j goes to zero, then logarithm of j goes to minus infinity, right? I guess I could write it as a limit, j going to zero from the right, logarithm of j equals minus infinity, right? Because because how how logarithm looks like something like that, right? Well, look what the uh, Neohookian model will do. Uh, if logarithm uh, j goes to minus infinity, this goes to plus infinity, and this goes to plus infinity too, okay? So this entire uh, psi of f in this case will explode to infinity, right? This, this will go to, z uh, the, fir the, the first term uh, goes to zero, but that doesn't matter because there's this infinity that, that, that the first term makes irrele irrelevant. So uh, that's why, oops, 
uh, that's why this is a more realistic model because it basically gives the material very strong uh, resistance to extreme compression. And this is what actual material is do, right? Like you cannot really squish things to zero volume because they will resist it more and more. So this actually is, is a good model in, in that sense. It's unfortunately a bad model numerically, right? Because going to infinity is not the greatest thing numerically, right? Uh, so what uh, people in physics-based animation usually do is instead, so the logarithm, uh, the minus logarithm of J that looks like this, it has this asymptote here, minus logarithm J, right? This would be J. Uh, so Newton's method can get pretty unhappy, okay, here in, in, the, in these crazy regimes especially as these numbers get like crazy, then you get in, like, in a lo lot of numerical trouble. So what uh, you can do to avoid these troubles is to say, hey, at some point, I, I like this behavior until a point, okay? At some point it just gets out of whack, so the energy just becomes like astronomically high. So before it gets there, I'll say, okay, let's stop here and let's just extend it with a polynomial term, okay? And this, this should be a smooth extension. So instead of using a logarithm, you can use logarithm until some point and then a polynomial, okay? In which case you avoid this problem of this going to infinity and you will still, you can still highly penalize uh, extreme deformations, okay? So that's a good compromise that's uh, often done. And I think that's about it. Do you have any questions on this? All right. Now then we'll stop here.